In this uh, session, I am going to uh, deal with a comparison between two major frameworks. One is uh, a banking based uh, framework, which is uh, the Basel 2 or Basel 3, and two is an insurance industry framework where both of them are targeting the risk management world itself. So, a Basel 2 framework is more framed from a banking industry's uh, perspective, whereas uh, Solvency 2 is from an insurance industry's perspective. And what we uh, see is there are a lot of commonalities between these two frameworks, while at the same time we see a lot of uh, differences in, in, in a few areas existing between these two frameworks. So, my intention is to identify the key areas where there are similarities versus the differences between these two frameworks. As I have initially highlighted, both of them are targeting uh, towards the risk management itself and the good thing is even they have the three pillar structure in commonality where the first pillar focuses on quantitative calculations, right? The first pillar focuses on the calculations of uh, what is the capital required and uh, from a risk measurement perspective like value at risk, various risk measures. So, how do you actually compute the capital requirement and how do I measure the various kinds of risks? That part is the pillar one under both the frameworks. And uh, in pillar two, they talk about the qualitative aspects of risk management, where the pillar one is more of quantitative aspects. Pillar two talks more and more about the qualitative aspects as well as the supervisory review. That is something that is taken care uh, by Basel as well as Solvency uh, 2 and the third one is more about the market discipline and disclosures which also is uh, more or less uh, in line for both the mechanisms but of course in some areas there exists some level of uh, uh, differences between these two frameworks and that is what uh, is something which we are uh, going to look at now. Now, from the key difference uh, standpoint, the Basel 2, the strong focus is more on the overall stability of the banking system because what we see is a systemic risk with respect to Basel 2 we see that the systemic risk is very much inherent in the banking sector. Whereas, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, insurance sector, rather than a systemic risk, we see more and more of individual insurers becoming insolvent. So, the risk specific to an insurer is what uh, is the major focus uh, as per solvency 2 mechanism because uh, there's a there's not that much chance of the whole system failing uh, together uh, in the insurance industry whereas in a banking industry because of the various uh, interdependencies and uh, one particular bank acting as a counterparty to the transactions of the other bank there is a kind of a systemic kind of an influence in the banking system. So, the focus of Basel is primarily on the overall solvency and overall stability of the banking system. Whereas, uh, when it comes to the solvency 2 norms, it is more on individual risks of the insurer, whichever can be quantified. So, that is the first key major difference that we observe. And on the same lines, the one area where we see some amount of differences between the two frameworks is the computation of VAR. While uh, Basel talks about separate VAR for market risk, credit risk, operations risk, 
individually compute them probably at 99% confidence level for market risk and 99.9% .9 confidence level for uh, credit risk and operations risk and it says each for each risk you compute the capital requirement separately and it also mentions that a stressed war for a 12 month period needs to be computed under a 12 month uh, assumption of stress the war needs to be computed and if at all there are any potential mark to market uh, losses especially especially when the counterparty is downgraded all the mark to market losses also can be uh, assumed into your war calculation and typically uh, a 12 month stressed war can be created but in general on a very broader scale what uh, Basel talks about is you calculate the war separately for market risk at 99% confidence level at 99.9% .9 confidence level for credit and operations risk and specify each one of them separately no mandatory thing from an integrated or enterprise kind of a perspective but when it comes to solvency 2 we are focusing on <coughs> the capital requirement based on the entire company's work means it takes individual risk and also the correlation between the various individual risk exposures and finally computes a VAR at an enterprise level. So that is what is the key difference. So uh, the kind of risk that each one of them take also is different, right, which we will be uh, seeing. But uh, from a VAR computation perspective, while uh, Basel is focusing on uh, the VARs for each risk type, the solvency 2 is focusing on integrated enterprise level uh, computation for VAR and that too at 99.5% confidence level. That is one major area that uh, we need to understand. Then one more aspect that is looking at is what kind of risks are considered by each of the models, by each of the frameworks. We know that uh, the Basel uh, as a part of 2 and an improvised version of 3, it majorly looked at credit risk, operations risk, a market risk and probably uh, we are uh, even uh, seeing uh, in Basel 3, there is a lot of uh, emphasis coming towards liquidity risk. So, this is, these are the major classes of risk that are uh, considered by Basel 3 where the focus is primarily on addressing the systemic risk. Whereas when it comes to solvency 2, it is more focused towards individual insurer's bankruptcy because the more and more dependency lies on how comfortable is the insurer to pay to its policy holders. And as a classification of lists, there is a lot to do with uh, underwriting risk which could cover the non-life insurance, life, health, all these kind of risks, how well they are underwritten. Then uh, probably the market risk, counterparty credit risk, operations risk, these are all a part of material risk. Whereas we even talk about the risk associated with the intangibles also with respect to the goodwills, with respect to uh, all the other uh, intangibles uh, that get covered uh, into the financial statements. Even those risks, uh, reputation related things are very much captured as a part of solvency too. That's one more area which requires a focus to understand. Then. The next thing is, when we, in insurance, as per solvency 2, we actually talk about two common terms. Solvency capital requirement, SCR, 
and minimum capital requirement MCR. The solvency two norms talk about these two terms. When I say SCR, it is the amount of capital that is required to handle the expected loss, unexpected losses. So for an insurance company, if I compute that this is the unexpected losses, I need to have this much of capital. This much should be there as a part of my capital. When I say capital, then probably on a broader scale, the assets minus the liabilities. So if I'm expecting this is my unexpected losses during the year, they should be present in the form of capital. And the intention is to ensure that the probability of default in the next one year is very, very low. The intention is to ensure that the probability of default is very, very low in the next one year. And if at all, any insurance company fails to meet this SCR requirement, Right. Uh, uh, at any point in time, if, uh, if any uh, insurance company fails to meet this SCR requirement, it is given a six months time period to come back to the target level, to either raise capital or whatever, to come back to the target level. But at the same time, along with the solvency capital requirement, there is something called Minimum capital requirement, which is a mandatory to have capital. When I use the word mandatory, if the insurance company does not have at least this much of capital, its license itself can be revoked by the supervisory. So generally what we see is the minimum capital requirement will be somewhere around 25 to 45 percent uh, of uh, the solvency capital requirement and any violation to meet that requirement could result in revocation of the license itself. And one more thing is this has to be generally funded by the own funds. So whatever it is instead of loan funds or uh, borrowed kind of fund they should be at least this much of uh, MCR should be funded by the own fund central. And whenever we look at the market value of this capital, we should ensure that at least 50% is tier 1. And when we talk about tier 1, we talk majorly from the perspective of share capital, retained earnings, are probably marketable securities which can be converted into cash quite immediately. So all these go as a part of tier 1 component. So what we are typically uh, saying is the market value of the capital, whatever we are talking about this, should contain at least 50% of the tier 1 component only. And whatever uh, the capital we are talking of, this, the characteristics of this capital is it should be subordinated to all claims which means only after the, all the claim payments are done the residual uh, goes uh, to the residual of the profits go to the capital uh, investors. So whatever are the claims paid only after that the capital investors will be getting their share of the capital. So that is where we call it as subordinated uh, to the claims. And this is what is a capital based requirement as far as uh, insurance industry goes. But with the banking, we have a, a straightforward kind of a mechanism. We are uh, talking about uh, uh, a total capital ratio of around 8%, right? Of which uh, tier 1 capital uh, ratio should be somewhere around 4.5%. We have discussed uh, all these things in our earlier session. And probably the same total capital ratio can go even up to 10.5% with the addition of 2.5% for the counter cyclical buffer. So this is what is the norm when we are uh, looking at uh, uh, the when we are looking at uh, the banking industry or Basel. Whereas when it comes to uh, insurance. 
using the solvency 2, the numbers are more based on SCR as well as MCR. Then, the other dimension is more to do with the diversification benefits. How are these diversification benefits? Whenever we use the word diversification benefit, we talk from the perspective of correlation that is existing between the various uh, risk classes and how well that correlation can reduce the overall risk exposure. When it comes to Basel, as we have uh, already mentioned, the Basel's focus is not, is the measurement of a separate capital for, for market risk, credit risk and operations risk. So, the interlinking, the interlinking or correlation between, let's say, the market risk and the credit risk, these are generally not captured or probably market risk and operation risk. So, these are not, uh, these are not uh, captured because you require the risk capital to be assessed uh, for each of the risk class separately, which means the diversification only within the risk classes, within market risk, within ops risk, within credit risk, I can have some kind of diversification, but not across the various risk categories. Similarly, within the line of business, within a business unit, there could be a diversification. So, that is what we typically uh, call as the level 1 kind of a risk, level 1 kind of a diversification. And uh, the Basel 2 is addressing only the level 1, wherein it can either... Uh, uh, identify the diversification benefits within a risk category or within a specific line of business but not across risk categories and across line of businesses. Whereas, uh, uh, and uh, as a part of the formula also, we know that the capital requirement is nothing but whatever is the total capital divided by the sum of all the risk weighted uh, assets per uh, credit and 12.5 uh, times whatever are the capital requirements per market and operations risk in the denominator. So, that is totally, uh, that should uh, be totally uh, greater than 8% which is what is the requirement as per basal. But when it comes to solvency 2, it allows for something to be compared at an organization level. The risk capital is determined at the organization level, not at one single risk category level or not at individual business lines level, which means though you determine them at uh, individual business lines and individual risk categories, you also consider the correlation between the various uh, risk categories and business lines and uh, finally arrive at uh, finding all the interdependencies between the various uh, capital requirements of, for various types of risk and uh, arriving, at, uh, arriving at the integrated capital requirements for the enterprise. So, that is where we say in case of solvency 2, level 1, level 2A, 2B and 3 risks are addressed. When I say level 1, it is only within risk category and within business lines. Whereas 2A, I talk about uh, within risk category but across business lines. So, I can do this kind of classification also. Whereas here, it is across risk categories within business life. And finally, this is across both. Across all risk categories and across all business lines is my level 3. So, does the, even if we look at the formula for computing the overall organization level solvency capital requirement, we talk about the square root of the correlation 
correlation between i and j where i let's say i talk about uh, solvency capital requirement with respect to market risk and solvency capital requirement uh, with respect to life risk and the correlation that is existing between them like that for all of the risk uh, categories that are there probably a uh, market risk credit risk operations risk life risk non life risk health risk and whatever are there the pair wise correlation between them multiplied by the solvency capital requirement for each of them and of course uh, this is the material part of the total capital requirement and we are also looking for the intangible part of uh, the total capital requirement also so as per solvency 2 we find out the correlation between the various uh, risk classes and various uh, levels of business units to finally uh, derive at the total uh, solvency requirement for the same then a few more uh, areas of course we have discussed uh, with respect to capital requirements basel is majorly focusing on uh, the minimum capital requirement or a total capital ratio of 8% and with a counter cyclical buffer going up to 10.5% and the major intention of this capital is to ensure that all the unexpected losses for each of the risk type are covered quite comfortably with uh, whatever the defined set of probabilities 99% for market and 99.9 for credit and operations whereas when it comes to solvency 2 the capital measurements we have uh, seen that you need to comply to scr solvency capital requirement and minimum capital requirement and the major objective of a capital requirement is to make sure that the default the probability of default in the next one year is going to be extremely low and from a time dimension if you see the computation mechanisms of uh, basel they are more and more retrospective they are based on uh, the historical uh, data they are based on uh, the the historical performance whereas uh, the calculations are done on a very high frequency basis especially the capital requirements or violation requirements the the solvency uh, requirement they are all performed on a very high frequency basis and uh, they are based on the past data whereas when it comes to solvency 2 it's more and more proactive or prospective in approach so though the calculation happens only once or twice in a year but the assessment of the solvency is a regular kind of a process and even when i look at the valuations the basel looks at sorry market based valuation as well as the financial statements accounting statements based valuation but when it comes to solvency 2 it's an economic balance sheet when when i am saying economic balance sheet there is an involvement of projected future cash flows future income statement so it is not coming from the uh, it's not coming from documentation of the historical uh, actuals but it is more of uh, projected futures coming up as a part of the valuation process then when we talk about uh, the pillar 2 related stuff where the focus is on qualitative aspects of the risk management as well as the supervisory review kind of stuff what we say is there both solvency 2 as well as basel they they follow the risk based supervision itself but compared to basel 2 we see that in solvency 2 even the supervision is extended to strategic processes that are followed by the company the various reporting procedures and even the valuation related stuff so which means the scope is slightly broader and wider not just restricted uh, to uh, risk management aspect even uh, a bit more on the risk management where the lookout is on 
the strategic processes, the reporting requirements as well as the valuation issues also. But when it comes to PESEL, all the material risks which are credit, operations, market, liquidity, all are assessed. Where, and uh, probably uh, even in uh, uh, solvency too, we see credit, operations, market and uh, uh, life, non-life, all these kind of material risks are very much addressed and apart from them even the intangibles is also addressed means apart from materials even the non-material related risks are also addressed and capital requirements are found out under the solvency 2 norms and when you look at uh, the basal Whatever the supervision that happens, whatever the reviews that happens, the major intention of these reviews is to ensure that the company is complied with the capital requirements. Whatever the, the tier 1 capital or total capital ratio or whatever it is, the main thing is to ensure that the company is compliant with the capital requirement. Whereas uh, even checking out uh, for the state of solvency of the insurance company state of solvency of the insurance company for also forms one of the important responsibilities of the supervisory process under the solvency 2 and as far as uh, the internal risk management uh, process is concerned both of them have their own uh, strong internal risk management uh, approaches uh, the bank vessel goes with internal capital adequacy assessment uh, process which is purely risk based, comprehensive and proactive or prospective kind of stuff whereas when it comes to uh, the solvency 2 norms they have their another framework called OSRA framework own risk, own risk and solvency assessment framework which is focusing more on strategic processes, strategic decisions. So, it because it uh, extends a little bit more compared to the basin. And when it comes to even uh, the governance part, in both of them, we see that uh, the, the governance norms are clear and transparent. Even the responsibilities are allocated uh, quite correctly. But the only thing is written policies written governance policies are applicable only at the management level in the basal but again when it comes to solvency 2 it gets extended to even a few more aspects like audit internal control outsourcing so the, again the scope of the governance document is slightly higher in case of uh, solvency 2 compared to the basal norms and even with respect to supervision, this is also another interesting aspect. With respect to supervision, both of them can intervene. In case of Basel, the regulators can, the supervisors can intervene in the middle, early, at the early stages. And even in Solvency 2, we see that the supervisors can intervene. But the major thing is, okay, in case of... Uh, uh, solvency 2, we see preventive and corrective measures are the prime responsibility. Whereas, when it, in case of banks, it is possible to intervene only when they really sense that this bank is going to fall below that uh, uh, required capital requirements. Right? Probably in case of insurance company, the intervention of the supervisors can be done at any point in time to bring out a preventive and a corrective, corrective action. Whereas when it uh, comes as per solvency, uh, as it when it comes under Basel, the possibility of early intervention is only under the scenario where the banks are expected to fall below the minimum capital requirement. So, that is one more uh, difference uh, as far as uh, the review process is concerned which is purely the pillar 2 of, uh, of Basel or even Solvency 2 requirement. 
Then from a third dimension, which is the, something related to the third pillar associated with uh, disclosure, it is required that both uh, the banks as well as insurance companies, they are mandated, they are required to disclose the, the quality of their own funds, regarding their own funds, what is the composition of them, how much is in retained earnings or how much is in uh, capital, how much uh, is... Uh, into uh, uh, how, how much of it is in the form of capital, how much is in uh, reserves, all that stuff has to be uh, clearly uh, disclosed and uh, the amounts of each of the composition and their quality, all those things need to be disclosed both by insurance companies as well as banks. But when, the, when we talk about uh, the Basel, the disclosure is only at the management level Whereas uh, when it uh, comes to uh, when it uh, comes to uh, solvency two, not just at the management level, even under uh, the audit or internal control, at various levels we require the the quality of the funds to be disclosed. And as we said, that when it comes to capital requirement, it has to disclose all these things separately. Whereas uh, when it uh, comes to solvency two. The minimum capital requirement MCR and solvency capital requirement SCR needs to be disclosed. They don't need to disclose at each individual risk type level. So these are some of the things that became uh, 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 that, that uh, would clearly create a kind of a difference between the PASEL norms used for banking sector and solvency two norms used for the insurance sector. If you have any further queries regarding the same, you can very well get back to me by giving me a call on the number that I have provided below or you can even send in an email at momsidhar at pacegurus.com. Thanks a lot for uh, listening to this session. Thank you very much.